Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2014 webinar series. Our webinar was developed with collaboration with Dr. Patrick Meyer of iRevolution. My name is Yana Aranda, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. When I'm not moderating webinars, I work with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, where I'm a senior program manager in our engineering for global development department. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar, Humanitarians in the Sky, How UAVs Are Changing Disaster Response. Humanitarian organizations are increasingly turning to unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs, for image recapture as part of disaster response and recovery projects. At E4C, we believe that ethical and safe integration of technology for development is critically important. So we've invited today's presenter, Dr. Patrick Meyer of iRevolution, to share insights on safe and responsible use of humanitarian UAVs, applied research on UAV technologies, and development of legislation. We thank you for joining us today, Patrick. Before we get rolling, I'd also take, like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series generally. Along with myself, we have Holly Schneider-Brown of IEEE, Mike Mater of ASME, and Steve Welch, also of IEEE, who work on developing and delivering the webinar series. Thank you, team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make recommendations for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact us via the email address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Before we move on to our presenter, we thought it'd also be a great idea to remind you about engineering for change and who we are. E4C is a global community of over 250,000 people, such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs or non-governmental organizations, social scientists, and others who work together to solve humanitarian challenges faced by underserved communities around the world, such as access to potable water, off-grid energy solutions, effective health care, agriculture, sanitation, and other areas. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of our coalition, including professional societies such as ASME, IEEE, ASCE, SWE, and ASHRAE, as well as academic supporters like MIT C-Lab, international development agencies such as USAID, EWBUSA, and Practical Action, as well as access to a passionate, engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy, and it's free. Check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. The webinar you're participating in today is one installment of the Engineering for Change webinar series. This free publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring innovative ideas and technology to bear on global development challenges. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archive videos of past presentations, can be found on our webpage, and you'll see the URL listed. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd also like you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. We look forward to hearing all your thoughts there. Our next webinar will be on September 24th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with Laura Hoffman, who is an assistant professor of political science at California Polytech State University, and Bruce Beike, the executive director of Invenio. Our topic will be Emerging Markets. And the top ICT4D, uh, for those of you not familiar with that acronym, it's Information and Communication Technologies for Development, and the associated hardware challenges uh, with those kinds of solutions. We invite you to visit the E4C webinar stage for registration details. If you're already an E4C member, we'll be sending you an invitation to the webinar directly. Hopefully we'll catch all of you on that one. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's see where everyone here is from today. In the chat window, uh, which you will see located on the bottom right of your screen, please type in your location. I'll start to give you guys an example. There we go. We already got some folks going. Welcome from Indiana. <laughs> Uh, we got folks from D.C., L.A., 
Palo Alto, Cambridge in the UK, Manila in the Philippines, Maryland. I mean, everyone is from all over. Some folks from London, Chennai, and San Diego. Yeah, thank you very much. A few folks from Canada. Cool. Welcome. Welcome all. Um, just for your reference, any technical questions or administrative problems should go in this very same chat window. Or feel free to send a private chat to Holly or myself if you have any issues. You can also use the chat window to type in any remarks you may have. During the webinar, we encourage you to please use the Q&A window located, located below the chat to type in your questions for the presenter. That way we'll be able to keep track of them uh, for the end of the webinar. If you are listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any troubles, try hitting stop and then start. If that doesn't work, you can use the call-in number for the teleconference. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. Follow the webinar to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour, or PDH, for this session. Please follow the instructions on the top of our webinar page. Again, the URL is listed. All right, so with that, I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker. Dr. Patrick Mayer is an internationally recognized thought leader and speaker on the application of new technologies for humanitarian response. He presently serves as the Director of Social Innovation at QCRI, where he develops next generation humanitarian technologies in partnership with several international humanitarian organizations. Patrick is also the author of the widely read blog, iRevolution, and of the forthcoming book, Digital Humanitarians, How Big Data is Changing the Face of Humanitarian Response. He previously co-founded and co-directed Harvard's program on crisis mapping and early warning, and served as director of crisis mapping at Ushahidi, well-recognized organization. Patrick is also the co-founder of the International Crisis Mapper Network and of the Digital Humanitarian Network. He has a PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, a pre from Stanford, and an MA from Columbia University. And we're very honored to have him here with us. So I'll turn it over to Patrick to take it from here. Thank you very, very much for this kind introduction. I'm really, really thrilled to, to have the opportunity um, to talk um, and share with you some of the work that I've been doing and really start a conversation um, with uh, your community and, and all of you. And this is not just for now and this hour that we have, but certainly as follow-ups as well. At any time, if you want to get in touch with me, my contact information, I think, has already been displayed and I'll display it as well. Uh, again, throughout the presentation. So I really look uh, at this as an opportunity to engage with all of you and to, to learn from you and um, to explore how we can all uh, help make the humanitarian space um, a better place and, and, and improve humanitarian response. So I uh, founded the Humanitarian UAV Network, or UAVators uh, for short, and the website is uaviators.org. The mission of the Humanitarian UAV Network is to facilitate the safe and responsible use of UAVs in humanitarian settings. And we do this by bringing together humanitarian organizations and UAV groups, UAV uh, experts, operators, so that they can better co collaborate and share information uh, during disasters. And I'll be saying a bit more about the Humanitarian UAV Network at the end uh, of my talk. What I want to do with this uh, next few minutes is to share with you not in just hypothetical terms, uh, you know, how UAVs might be used in humanitarian settings, but exactly, but exactly how they are and have been in just the past few months, in just the past six months, used in humanitarian settings, ranging from uh, major massive flooding in in, in Europe to uh, typhoons in the Philippines and and important humanitarian and, and development work in in Haiti. Um, then I want to discuss, uh, you know, what are we going to do with all this imagery? This, this imagery is quickly becoming a big data challenge, meaning that it's becoming overwhelming. Uh, we, we, can't, we can't make sense of this imagery as quickly as we need to, so, so how are we going to tackle that challenge? And then, as I said, I want to end with, with uh, a bit uh, of a description on, on the Humanitarian UAV Network, the, the concrete actions and collaborations that we're taking, and then end really with a couple of slides on just policy. There's some really important policy issues that UAVs do bring up, and we need to address this proactively with enlightened leadership and policy making rather than reactively. Before I jump into these humanitarian UAVs in action, just uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with UAVs, so, so as a quick background to the, the technology 
uh, itself, you have two types of UAVs. Uh, you have uh, what's called rotary wing UAVs uh, and fixed wing UAVs. Here's a picture of a rotary wing UAV, more specifically a quadcopter, because it's got four propellers. And this is a UAV, the, a quadcopter that the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, UN OCHA, uh, has been uh, experimenting with and is looking to deploy in future humanitarian uh, relief operations. If you look a bit more closely at this particular UAV that happens to be a, a DJI Phantom II, you have is you have a camera that's uh, attached to the bottom of the UAV, and that is the sensor that is collecting data, in this case, you know, imagery, uh, videos, as well as, as still pictures. Now, rotary wing UAVs like quadcopters have certain advantages over fixed wing, but they also come with a number of disadvantages. One of the major advantages is that you have this kind of automatic, you have this uh, takeoff and landing that is vertical takeoff uh, and landing, and you can hover over one given area. If that's an area that you specifically need high resolution imagery for, you can just keep that particular quadcopter uh, very still and at, say, 100 feet um, and capture the imagery you need for disaster damage assessments and so on. On the other end of the spectrum, we have what's called fixed-wing UAVs, and this is an example uh, here of two fixed-wing UAVs um, It's part of a project that I recently joined in southern Turkey about uh, two weeks ago. Um, the advantages of fixed-wing UAVs is that they have a greater range. They can go a few kilometers, uh, and they can capture a lot more imagery in a shorter period uh, of time. And one of the reasons I'm sharing these pictures with you is I want to make very clear that the kind of UAVs we're talking about in humanitarian settings are not these massive 25 kilo, one ton, you know, huge uh, uh, remotely piloted aircraft systems. We're really talking about the very small, ultralight um, uh, UAVs, micro UAVs. This particular UAV here doesn't weigh, it weighs about 600 to 700 grams max. Uh, so almost the, size, the, the weight of a, of, a, of, a, of a soccer ball, if you'd like. And if you uh, look at this next video here that you should see an EB here in Turkey uh, landing, you can see how this is an automatic landing. You can see how softly it lands. And if you notice in the previous picture, the propeller is on the back of the UAV. It's not in the front. So it is incredibly lightweight, incredibly safe uh, to use in multiple uh, different settings. Now, both fixed wing and rotary wing UAVs are becoming more and more intelligent. That's what really differs them from remote controlled airplanes that we've had over for decades and decades. They can fly themselves. So both the EB and uh, rotary wing uh, quadcopters now come with software that allows you to pre-program a given flight uh, path. And again, this is a screenshot of some work we were doing, uh, not in the humanitarian sense, but with archaeologists in southern Turkey a couple of weeks ago. They had needed high-resolution aerial imagery of specific areas around these archaeological sites, and all we had to do was simply program the flight paths and the altitudes at which these uh, UAVs would fly and capture the imagery. So it's really becoming, this software has also become really easier to use, and that's really important because a lot of the accidents that do happen, in the, and, and let's be honest, we do see accidents, has to do with pilot error more often than not. So moving towards automated uh, uh, flight plans and so on is, is an important trend that we're going to see happening more and more, uh, and it, it's a good thing uh, that we're headed in that particular direction. So now let's get into uh, these UAVs in action in humanitarian settings. You may have heard back in May and June of this year uh, the worst flooding in, in 120 years of weather measurement uh, hit the Balkans, southern eastern Europe. Um, really just, uh, just, just devastating in terms of the impact, not only in terms of the flooding, but the kind of mudslides and landslides that this created. So uh, a group called Icarus, a European group out of uh, Belgium, uh, who are part of the humanitarian UAV network, um, were invited by the uh, government the Bo of Bosnia and Herzegovina to the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina to uh, get high resolution aerial imagery, but not only that. Um, as you know, in the 90s, there were quite extensive conflicts in that uh, part of, of Europe after the Cold War. Uh, huge minefields are still in place right now. There's been an, uh, great efforts around the demining uh, of certain areas, but there's still huge landmines, uh, fields of landmines that are that are still in some of these areas. And what happens? Um, 
with this major flooding and the mudslides and so on is that many of these mines and minefields were completely displaced. So you can imagine many villagers and local communities being forcibly displaced because of the flooding. But what they didn't know when the floods subsided was that the minefields had also been displaced. And so they had no idea as they were returning to their homes how much danger they were in. And so the government invited the, the team from Belgium, Icarus, to fly their UAVs, in this case uh, quadcopters, to not only do assessment of disaster damage and so on in the debris, but also to look for these mines and identify where they are and, 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 and where they've been displaced. And what was staggering when I, when I talked to the pilot, uh, Harris, who did the, uh, the flight, he found, they found that um, some of these mines had been moved by, by about 15 miles from one location to the next. So it was a really, really serious uh, issue. Here are the quadcopters. They flew this quadcopter for 25 different flight plans, uh, 22 different flight plans uh, across some of these areas. And they had, obviously, the, some of the maps of where the line mines were. And sometimes these mines could be identified through the imagery and sometimes not. Um, but here is some video imagery of these quadcopters. I'm not sure if the video is coming out very well through the webinar, but these were uh, videos that were captured in some of the disaster-affected areas where they had knew that you know, there were some landmines uh, as well. So this was not only for landmines, but also disaster damage. The imagery also helped them identify you know, some of the, 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 the damage to the dams and, and the areas nearing the rivers and, and so on. Um, in addition to that, what they did was get high resolution aerial imagery, create 3D topographical models of these areas. Now, why was that important? Well, because they knew that certain landmines were on some of these hills and the sides of these mountains and so on. But with the landslide and mudslides that and the flooding, some of these mines would have been washed away and uh, further downside. Uh, and so what they did is used geostatistical techniques to try and model potentially where some of these mines might have been um, displaced in. So this is the project in, in the Balkans. And in, in another project in Haiti, they've been using uh, mostly fixed-wing UAVs. Uh, to do a number of different projects. One project with IOM, the International Organization for Migration, looked at using these UAVs for rapid damage assessment, uh, as well as identifying which refugee camps uh, were being uh, abandoned, because there were now you know, more formal shelters that refugees could be uh, moved to. And another uh, you know, project, which we don't really hear about when we talk about Hurricane Sandy. When we talk about Hurricane Sandy, we tend to only think about New York. But Hurricane Sandy actually passed through uh, Haiti and created some massive flooding in a number of areas. And so uh, IOM and others used the aerial imagery captured from the UAVs to rapidly assess how many houses had collapsed near a certain river, how many people had been affected by the flooding. But they also used it after. Hurricane Sandy had passed because what happened was with all this rain and flooding, there were many areas of standing water. And as we know, standing water is bad news uh, in many places because that is a ripe then for mosquitoes and all kinds of other public health uh, concerns. So these UAVs were used to identify these uh, areas of standing water as well. In another project by uh, Carto SM and open street map community in France, they work directly with local communities to train them on how to use these UAVs. And here is um, some of the, uh, well, this was the imagery that was captured by IOM and, and drone adventures uh, over about a, a six-day period. And I'll just, um, before I talk about the other project, point your attention to the resolution. I mean, we're talking about three to nine centimeter resolution. There's, you know, the best commercial satellite, which was just launched last week, uh, which is a big breakthrough in satellite imagery analysis and capture, it captures imagery at 31 centimeters. And that is almost you know, double what's been available. It's been 50 centimeters resolution before. And so with, with aerial imagery, you're talking about orders of magnitude. And in, 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 in Turkey, a couple of weeks ago, we were taking a two, three centimeter resolution. So it, it is hugely, hugely important. Uh, here's that other project I was mentioning. And hopefully, you'll see the video. Um, don't worry about the sound, because people are talking in Haitian Creole you'll see these subtitles um, on the screen. 
This was just, by the way, in June, uh, just outside of Port-au-Prince. Oops. I'm not sure if you see it in the video. There seems to be something wrong with it. Here they're adding the SIM, the card, the memory card to the camera that gets fitted inside the EV. This is the, the same UAV we used in Turkey. And it's very easy to launch. All you do is you shake it, that initiates the, the propeller, and you've already programmed your flight, so you just literally throw it up in the air. You really don't need remote control joysticks or anything else. And then it just follows its pre-programmed flight. So here you see a, a great example of a community-based, community-centered approach to using these UAVs, and that's really, really important. All the projects that I've interacted with or been involved with, it's been key to have community engagement, community empowerment, and community leadership uh, around the use of the UAV, these UAVs. Community mapping is not a new field. Public participatory GIS has been around for decades. There's a lot of rich literature. Um, around uh, the use of uh, technology for mapping purposes. And I, as well as many of my colleagues, see the UAV as just another technology, another data collection uh, technology um, that can be used by local communities. And the great thing about this project with Carte uh, NG and um, OSM France is that they're basically training these local communities to launch their own uh, UAVs themselves and to repair them and maintain them and to analyze the imagery. And that's really, really important part of all this. It, 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 we have to do community engagement. The use of UAVs in precision agriculture doesn't require any of that necessarily. But humanitarian settings and development settings is very, very different. Uh, and I can't stress that enough. On that point, um, community engagement doesn't mean engagement of just men in the community. In this video, if you keep watching it, you see people watching the UAVs, and it's mostly women. And if we're going to have real community engagement around the use of these new technologies for humanitarian development purposes, women need to be directly involved. They need to take leadership positions and, 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 and be trained themselves in using these UAVs because they're going to need know where imagery needs to be taken that, uh, that men will not know or not prioritize. So it's really important that this UAV technology gets democratized within local communities as well across genders and age groups. Moving to the Philippines, in November of last year, Typhoon Haiyan, or as it was called, Typhoon Yolanda locally, was, so this day, still the most devastating typhoon to make landfall, the most powerful in terms of wind speed uh, when it reached uh, the mainland of the Philippines. And so the devastation was, was incredible. Uh, it really reminded a lot of us uh, uh, 
about what tsunamis do. I mean, just a storm surge was incredible, uh, the, the impact that it had, just devastating. So one group uh, called Drone Adventures um, partnered with Medair, which is a Swiss humanitarian organization. This was a, a few months, uh, two months after the typhoon. And the purpose of this project was to help in the reconstruction, redevelopment, and rehabilitation of some of the most disaster-affected uh, areas. And I'm seeing some of the uh, questions coming in um, right now, and I promise to answer as many of them after my talk. There's some great questions, and I, I have answers for most of them. Um, but it's hard to do both the presentation and the, and the typing for the, for the answers, and uh, better to leave it at the end. Um, but please uh, do follow up with those questions. I would also add uh, for this particular project, which was done in Takloban, which is one of the most hardest hit areas, what they used were EB's fixed wing UAVs. And um, basically, the importance here was to create very high-resolution 2D and 3D topographical models of the disaster-affected areas. And in one area, Leyte, which is just north, a uh, town just north of Takloban, 80% of the households and um, croplands had been destroyed. And what Medair there was doing was working with the local communities, providing them with the materials, as well as the expertise needed to rebuild their houses, or to build new houses from scratch, new shelters from scratch. And what this imagery allowed Medair to do was identify at the household level which families needed more, uh, more materials, which families were falling behind in terms of the rebuilding, and allowed them to not, not only provide them with more support, more materials, but also to advocate on their behalf with respect to the local government and local humanitarian organizations and so on. So both the operational use of this, of this imagery for reconstruction and development, but also for advocacy and lobbying. And that's a, that's a use case that other organizations, such as the UN, have also uh, made explicit to me as being really important, uh, an important use of this imagery for disaster setting. So you're seeing here, this is in, this is in Takloban area, one of the hard, uh, sorry, Leyte, one of the hardest hit um, areas. And information sharing is really, really important here. Uh, and I should note that I was seconded to the UN uh, right after Typhoon Yolanda and was astounded by the number of different uh, uh, UAV projects that were ongoing. It was truly unprecedented. In Haiti, we, after the earthquake, we'd seen one or two big, huge drones used for imagery analysis and imagery capture. But here we saw about a dozen small uh, UAV projects. But uh, I, was, I was struck that most of them weren't sharing imagery with local communities. And this was an exception. And I'm really, really, uh, I really like this picture that you're seeing here, because what Drone Adventures decided to do in local partnership with the mayor's office and local communities is after, within 24 hours of capturing the imagery, they would go to a local banner shop and pay the, the local owner to print these maps, not on a hard copy paper that can easily be destroyed by rain and folding and so on, but on a, but on a banner, on a, three, on a, on a rollable uh, waterproof banner. And then they could share that back with local communities, with the mayor, mayor's office, and it would be a lot more um, durable. And I remember seeing also pictures where you had then local communities and mayor's office who would use post-its. And they would then gather around the map and, and, and add post-its with certain, you know, pieces of information saying, oh, we should prioritize this area. So it really then it facilitates, you can get this very high technology uh, UAV, high resolution aerial imagery, and then, and then still have it accessible to local communities for community engagement, community discussion. So that's a really, really important part of what we in the Humanitarian UAV Network actively uh, promote. So those are some UAVs in different settings, rotary fixed-wing UAVs um, used in humanitarian action just over the past six months. I want to now shift to what do we do with all this imagery because it's becoming a big data challenge. And that's not only me saying that, colleagues at uh, FEMA are saying this and colleagues at the, in the European Union are saying this. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to start facing a major big data challenge as these UAVs become more accessible and more democratized because they cost less and less and are easier to fly and safer to fly, we'll see members of the crowd, uh, journalists and others, starting to use these UAVs uh, in everyday settings but also in disaster zones. So one way to try and make sense of this imagery um, is using crowdsourcing or, or more specifically microtasking. And this is a project in the Philippines. This is downtown Tacloban near a hospital, the major main hospital there, Corfil DSI, a local UAV uh, startup in the Philippines, flew one of these EVs to capture this imagery. 
and then shared it with a group called Humanitarian Open Street Map, which has a crowdsourcing platform. And microtasking basically means smart crowdsourcing, in my opinion. They take this imagery and they slice it up into all these micro images, just like you see in this grid, and then they upload it to their microtasking platform and invite volunteers, digital volunteers from all around the world, to trace the imagery, to trace the roads, to identify which buildings have been damaged and which roads are still passable and which have debris on them. And here's an animation. Uh, this is not of aerial imagery, but of satellite imagery of this area. But they're doing the same thing with aerial imagery. This is a product of hundreds, literally, of volunteers who are tracing um, this, this imagery, uh, often within just a matter of days. So that's one, one approach. Another approach on the other end of the spectrum is using artificial intelligence and machine learning. So my colleagues uh, at the Joint Research Center in Europe are using machine learning to create machine learning classifiers to identify certain features of interest. This is in a project from just last year in the Philippines, uh, in Haiti, pardon me. After the earthquake, there was a massive amount of rubble. And two, three years later, there still was a lot of rubble. And that literally slows down the redevelopment, reconstruction efforts. Um, and so a number of NGOs there got in touch with my colleagues at the Joint Research Center and said, can you help us identify where the remaining rubble is? And then at that point, only about half of the rubble had been removed. But they wanted to know exactly, you know, from an empirical perspective, where this rubble was, and how much of it was where, and so on. And so um, the JRC used uh, aerial imagery from UAVs to, to basically create a high-resolution map of uh, Port-au-Prince and then use machine learning to automatically identify where some of this rubble was. And this classifier had an accuracy of 92%, which is quite, quite high, and really then shows that we can use this again uh, in future disasters as well. So those, the two end of the spectrum is, is the crowdsourcing and the machine learning. What we're doing on our end uh, at QCRI is we're partnering with the UN to bring these two methodologies together, to combine crowdsourcing and machine learning, because we believe that that is the sweet spot we have to hit in order to make sense of increasingly large volumes of aerial imagery. So this is a project called MicroMappers, which is both free and open source, still under development, and we're going to be piloting uh, this platform for aerial imagery uh, next month with uh, some colleagues in Africa. But basically what you have here is you have a web-based interface. We upload a, 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 an image taken from high-resolution aerial imagery, and we invite volunteers to trace, uh, similar to OpenStreetMap, to trace features of interest. For example, in this case, shelters that no longer have any roofs on them. And then what we want to do is collaborate with our partners at the Joint Research Center and basically have these traces, these features that are traced, feed into a machine learning uh, algorithm so that as volunteers are tracing these features, we have an artificial intelligence uh, engine that is learning to recognize what a shelter without a roof looks like and then can look at the rest of the imagery and accurately tag the uh, sh shelters without roofs or buildings without roofs in the rest of the imagery so that volunteers don't need to spend two weeks or 40 hours nonstop doing that completely manually. We, we really think that the sweet spot has to be a hybrid human computing with machine computing uh, solution. Moving on now to just the uh, last uh, 10 or so slides, Max. Um, humanitarian UAV Network, or UAVators.org. I've been flying UAVs for the past couple of years and, and gone a number of UAV missions in other fields, in uh, ocean protection and archaeology, as just mentioned. Uh, but it wasn't until I was in the Philippines after Typhoon Haiyan last year that I realized that now was the time to, to launch a community of practice around the use of UAV, because a number of these UAV projects were not talking to each other, which is not... Uh, we can do better. I mean, it, not talking to each other means that uh, there are potentially some concerns around safety and security. If you have multiple UAVs flying in the same area and you're not, you don't know about it, that can create some concerns. But also, just from a coordination and efficiency perspective, you don't need five UAVs flying over the same area. You need one UAV, and then you share the imagery. And like I said, most UAV projects were not sharing imagery with local communities or local government, and that's a problem. So I realized that this was a time to launch the humanitarian uh, UAV network. And we've been really busy over the past uh, few months. Uh, like I mentioned, one of the missions here is to facilitate the coordination of UAV. So if you go to the UAVators.org website, there's an operations page uh, that is deliberately dedicated to facilitating 
the sharing of imagery, the, the, where humanitarians can request imagery and where UAV operators can provide imagery. It's very simple, and this is really at the request of the humanitarians. They want to keep it as a very simple website, nothing too sophisticated or fancy. They just want it to work, and we can get more sophisticated later on. Uh, much to my surprise and, and honestly my shock, when I launched the Humanitarian UAV Network, I realized there had been no code of conduct anywhere that has been developed for the use of UAVs in humanitarian settings. And so we decided to create our own, uh, which is also available through the Humanitarian UAV Network. It's deliberately in a Google Doc, in an editable, open Google Doc format, because it has to be a community-driven uh, process. And, and we've gone through many, many iterations uh, over the past few months, uh, people commenting on how to improve it. And this is coming both from humanitarians and UAV experts and researchers. Uh, and others who are, who are helping us refine uh, this code of conduct. And so we very much welcome the input from your community and members of this community to help us improve this. And I frankly think it's always going to be in draft form. Uh, things are changing very quickly, and we can, we can, there will always be room for, for improvement. We are also in the process of carrying out a comprehensive evaluation. We can also see that uh, early results of that on the UAV Eaters website. We've evaluated or reviewed over 100 and 150 different UAVs, as well as tec uh, camera technologies, payload mechanisms, and imagery software for analysis uh, and stitching of imagery. We're collaborating right now with a European center to create the first and uh, so far only uh, UAV training and certification course specifically dedicated to uh, humanitarian organizations and humanitarian professionals and others who want to use UAVs in humanitarian settings. And we're also actively involved in the lobbying and advocacy and awareness raising around laws and regulation. Uh, so for example, we've launched a wiki uh, around this, uh, which you can also find through the Humanitarian UAV Network website that is a bit of a trip advisor for UAV travel, but also includes a country directory of laws uh, where they exist. Um, I may have a screenshot of that later, but, but to bring to your attention another uh, project that we've launched recently is a crisis map, is a crowdsourced crisis map of aerial imagery of disaster areas from all around the world. Um, and there are two reasons we, two motivations behind this particular uh, UAV aviators map. One is I believe that the crowd, that members of the public are part of the solution. And yes, there are a lot of concerns and understandably around um, members of the public who are buying a quadcopter you know, at Walmart one week and then flying it the next week in humanitarian settings. We don't really want disaster tourists flying these planes without having a sense of what they should be doing and not be doing in terms of the code of conduct. But at the same time, they could be a part of the solution because humanitarians cannot be everywhere at the same time. And professional UAV operators and DIY UAV operators cannot be everywhere at the same time. And we're already seeing members of the public sharing aerial imagery, videos, pictures, and so on. And what we want to do is say, hey, there's a place for members of the public. You, they can be a part of the solution. And here's one way you can be part of the solution is by sharing your imagery and video um, uh, on this particular map. And the second motivation is we're using this map to raise awareness around the code of conduct. So when somebody wants to add their videos, and soon next month you'll be able to add pictures as well, um, we, 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 we provide a link to the code of conduct and say, please, before you upload this video, read this code of conduct. And when somebody wants, is ready to upload a video, we ask them to you know, check a checkbox saying that they hereby confirm that they've read the code of conduct. Now, of course, not everybody will read it, but we're, we're, we're still hoping that this is one way to create attention and a magnet where people, members of the public, will want to help, and in the process, they get exposed to the code of conduct. So we're not only crowdsourcing the collection of uh, aerial imagery during disasters, we're also trying to crowdsource awareness. We're trying to bring people to this map and to educate them at the same time about some of the do's and don'ts. Um, and what's really interesting, a few weeks ago, there was a major storm typhoon in the Philippines. And uh, we had one member of the Humanitarian UAV Network, who's a professional uh, UAV pilot, who within 24 hours uploaded some, some videos and, and, and talked to the local communities and got engaged with the local communities um, uh, in doing this as well. So made them also in, in, in taking inclusive approach to that. Um, other applications of UAVs that the Humanitarian UAV Network is um, interested in is a payload delivery. So 
uh, Mid Sentinel Frontier, as well as uh, UNICEF, are actively exploring the idea of payload delivery. Uh, we conducted a search and rescue UAV challenge in Virginia a couple months ago, where part of the challenge was to not only identify clothing uh, items of clothing uh, in a giant, huge farm area, but also to then land uh, or drop rather a first aid kit. So this is a very uh, a real use case for humanitarian response for search and rescue. Um, and what uh, MSF, Doctors Without Borders, and, and UNICEF are exploring now is can they also transport um, uh, vaccines and blood samples between community health clinics in uh, South America and in, in Africa. Here's another prototype uh, that some colleagues of mine are building, and that's a hybrid. It's not just a quadcopter or rather a rotary wing or a fixed wing. It's, it's a combination of a tricopter and a fixed wing. And the advantage of this is that you potentially have the, you have the op option of doing vertical takeoff and landing and also totally automated vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, but then you potentially have the range of a fixed wing as well. Uh, so it remains to be seen. It's still very much an R&D uh, project, but they're aiming for 50 to 60 kilometer range and a payload where you see the cross there, uh, a payload of about one to two kilograms. Uh, they will be piloting this um, uh, and experimenting with this this fall. They've had their first flight recently, which was very exciting. Um, other applications of UAVs also, you, know, you can use other sensor technology, not just pick, you know, cameras. Uh, uh, having infrared is really important for search and rescue. In fact, that's what some of the pilots I talked to with in the Philippines said uh, after their operation. Then the next, next time this happens, they will bring infrared cameras so that they can look for uh, people who might still be alive under the rubble and looking for heat signatures. Uh, other sensors could be looking to uh, assess whether cell phone towers are still operational or to look for uh, um, uh, electromagnetic uh, waves from, from I'm not an engineer, from, uh, from uh, cell phones, right? If cell phone is still operational, you can detect that cell phone is on. And you could fly UAVs low across the rubble to look for cell phone uh, activity uh, as well. So those are other use cases. And I want to end now with a couple of slides just on policy, because uh, policy is obviously really, really important. Uh, sense and avoid technology is key, right? Uh, there are genuine and serious concerns around the use of UAVs and, and civilian drones, as they're also called. Uh, near near airports. I mean, that, that, is, that is just asking for trouble. And anybody who's using UAVs and drones near airports without prior written permission from the control tower at the airport and uh, live communication during the UAV deployments is really a fool. Uh, this can be really serious consequences. And, and so we're all very much, very much pro code of conduct, know what the do's and don'ts, uh, and, and manage the risk as much as possible uh, until sense and avoid technologies become more widely available. They're still being developed. There are few interesting developments already and, and pilots that are being uh, tried. Um, but we still have quite a, uh, from what I hear from the experts, we have a couple of years to go until we really have very robust sense and avoid technology between UAVs as well as, as piloted aircraft. That being said, um, my own perspective on the added value of UAVs uh, is really, I'm more interested in using UAVs in areas that are completely overlooked uh, by mainstream relief efforts, which happens time and time again. And that's not a criticism. I been working in the humanitarian space for 10 plus years, and so this is not a criticism against the humanitarian and my colleagues. It's just a reality that humanitarians cannot be everywhere at the same time, and they're going to try and prioritize what they can do. But if they have an area that's completely disconnected, offline, and hard to access physically, these areas tend to not be uh, served right away compared to more rural, uh, rather urban uh, areas. So I'm more interested in the use of these UAVs in disconnected areas that are hard to reach to. And by definition, these areas are not complex airspaces. There are no UN helicopters flying over these areas. They are being overlooked. And that's where I think there's a very real opportunity, safe opportunity, to use UAVs in these settings. And then as one expert told me at a, at a leading policy conference in Brussels a couple months ago, he said, you know, at this point, the best sense and avoid technology is your, are your eyes and ears. And, and that's really true, especially if you're flying by line of sight, where you always keep an eye on the UAV. It doesn't go beyond your line of sight. Because frankly, if you've been near airports or helicopters, these UN helicopters and cargo ships make an immense amount of noise. They can be heard from literally miles away. And so 
you know, as soon as you, if you are a, a UAV operator in a disaster area and it's a remote area, but you, you happen to hear a helicopter or, or a cargo plane, then it takes you 10 to 15 seconds max to drop altitude, and you're usually not flying anywhere at that level of altitude anyway. So you can use these technologies responsibly and safely in humanitarian settings now. You don't have to wait two years, um, but you have to be a responsible. Much lies in Washington. Some of you may, may remember this earlier this year. Uh, a very well-respected group out of Texas NAM was ready to go using the UAVs, but uh, from what I hear, a, a low-end bureaucrat kind of uh, freaked out and said no. And this is despite families of um, loved ones being trapped and unaccounted for signing off and saying, yes, please use these UAVs to find, to find survivors potentially here. Um, and that's going to become that decision by government or others to say, no, you can't fly the UAVs. It's going to become an increasingly untenable decision to make. Uh, it's, it's, there's going to be more and more retention around that, especially when you realize that DIY UAV pilots, like this particular individual, uh, again, can be a part of the solution and, and, and was able to find a man that has been missing for, for over three days. And, and there were you know, official search and rescue teams, helicopters, dogs, hundreds of volunteers who were using traditional methods to look for this elderly person. And after three days, still had no, found no sign of him. And this UAV quadcopter pilot uh, finds this individual within 20 minutes, right, and literally saved their life. So, there's going to be more and more tension around policy and government around this, but I think there are ways to collaborate and to reduce the risks and allow the use of these UAVs uh, to be used in responsible ways. And at the end of the day, at the, at the international level, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, has a very clear humanitarian imperative that the international community must provide humanitarian assistance. And when that assistance is available in the form of UAVs to capture imagery, to search for people, to assess damage, to deliver medical supplies, um, and government says, no, you can't fly, that is a problem. And so the Humanitarian UAV Network is actively involved in bringing together some of the conversations around legislation, regulation with it, and humanitarian professionals and policymakers so that we can better figure out how do we manage this particular tension moving forward. Uh, this week, I believe, uh, the UN is going to release a very important policy document on humanitarian UAVs. I, it, it, I will share it on my blog, iRevolution. I will tweet it. It's going to be required reading for any of us who are interested in the use of humanitarian UAVs. In this particular document, policy document, official UN policy document, we're very grateful that the UN has actively, uh, you know, encouraging humanitarian organizations to, to collaborate with the humanitarian UAV network. That's something that we're very excited about as we are also actively reaching out to a number of humanitarian organizations. We're going to be uh, co-organizing with the UN in New York uh, in November a experts meeting on humanitarian UAVs to bring together UAV experts with humanitarians to catalyze collaborations and to have these conversations around data privacy, safety and security, regulation and legislation, and so on. Um, in closing, this is my email address. You can email me anytime, not just today and tomorrow, but if in a year or two you remember this presentation and you've got a question or an idea for a project, really, I, I do answer all emails. So don't hesitate to contact me at any time. And all these projects I shared are also available on my blog and also in my forthcoming book that was kindly um, uh, included in, in, the, in the introduction, uh, Digital Humanitarian, uh, which you can find out more on my blog as well. So thank you very much uh, for your interest and attention. I know there have been a lot of conversations, so now I'm going to go read them, and, and hopefully we can have some good uh, conversations around the questions that you have. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Patrick. This is uh, an incredible presentation that, that uh, you've shared with us, and one that is so full uh, that uh, you have generated <laughs> more Q&A than I think I've seen in a very long time, and I'm going to try to tackle everyone's questions. Uh, so please, if you have a question, enter into the Q&A window so I don't lose track between the chat and the Q&A. So uh, I'm going to start off uh, with a question that came in, uh, which is of a practical nature. Um, someone sure. asked if you can share more about uh, the costs and abilities of UAVs, especially for uh, NGOs working in very remote, high-altitude areas with 
obviously minimal infrastructure such as roads for data collection and so forth. That's a really, really great question. And that's one of the reasons we've been carrying out this comprehensive evaluation um, of UAVs. I mentioned over 100 UAVs, 150 UAVs that we've reviewed based on a number of parameters, including costs. So if you go to the UAV website, I'll, I'll, I'll link it to it here, and you go to the documents section, you'll, look, you'll see that um, a document there is entitled Comprehensive Review of UAVs. If you click on that, you'll see 150 plus UAVs reviewed based on different parameters, uh, range, cost, uh, all kinds of things. And then you can just filter from you know, low cost to high cost. But I'll answer just very quickly, give you an idea. The DJI Phantom that I mentioned that the UN is exp experimenting with, um, mm -hmm. that cost, the, the version they bought, which is the latest, latest version, cost about $1,000. The version before that cost about $500. But you can also get uh, quadcopters and tricopters that are closer to the 200 and $300 range, and like mobile phones and uh, t computers and laptops, those costs are going to just continue radically decreasing over the next years. Um, and some of people are saying in the next 10 years, they're going to be costing $10, $20 max. There's going to be huge competition amongst private sector companies and startups in, in this market. And so it's going to become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. The other fixed wing UAV uh, that I mentioned, and I showed a few videos and pictures of the EV, is created by SenseFly, a Swiss company, that will set you back about $20,000. Uh, and that includes, uh, within that $20,000, uh, uh, $6,000 for the software that comes with it, which is a good thing because then it's heavily discounted. So you have one of the most professional, sophisticated uh, UAV aerial imagery software, PIX4D, that's bundled in with the EV. So that's $20,000 uh, for that particular package. And again, I, you know, I believe that this uh, cost will also decrease um, in the future. Um, so hopefully that answers the first set of questions. Uh, that's very thorough. Um, another question came in regarding um, coordination of several UAVs in the same area. So is it possible for a single user to manage more UAVs at the same time, uh, especially when you're covering a large area? Yes, and that's what we had to do in uh, southern Turkey uh, in the archaeological sites that we were flying over. Now, of course, I'm saying this is not in the humanitarian context, but because we humanitarians tend to be the last adopters of every technology on the planet, I often and, and happily you know, collaborate with other fields to see how they're using technology. So I, I collaborated with this group in Turkey. And what we did is we used three EVs. We programmed their flights um, on one computer and then looked at them flying on the same computer. Um, and so that way, within about 45 minutes, we were able to capture a lot more imagery than we would be, obviously, with one, with one EB. And the EBs have a sense of void technology, so if any EB gets closer than 10 meters to another EB, they do an evasive sort of immediate evasive maneuvers. One goes up in altitude, the other one goes, goes down. Now, that's uh, a great use case because you, you have all the UAVs, so you're doing the programming and so on. In other situations where you have different groups using different technologies and so on, flying different types of UAVs, then, it, then you need a bit more coordination, which is precisely one of the, re one of the reasons why I've launched the humanitarian UAV network and why we have this operations page, is to help facilitate the sharing of uh, flight plans as much as mm -hmm. possible and contact information so that you have three different groups in Takloban in the Philippines who are going to fly on the same day, they better like, have their phone number, each other's phone numbers, and have shared their flight plans as well. And that's what we're trying to help coordinate and facilitate as part of the humanitarian UAV network. In the future, uh, from what I'm hearing from experts who are doing this kind of uh, you know, artificial intelligence, sense and avoid detection, and so on, we, we, we may be able to get to a point in the next two to three years where you can have all kinds of different UAVs flying at all kinds of different altitudes in the same area and all avoiding each other. But we're not there yet, which is why the human collaboration uh, is really important. We haven't automated that yet, and it's going to be important to have that human part in any event. I think you tackled another question that we had regarding autopilot technology. Um, and if there, uh, I guess if you can speak a little bit more, is there any experimentation being done currently with autopiloting? So, I mean, I, I think, yes, that's a great question. And, and, and the trend is really towards autonomous flight, to uh, autopilot mm -hmm. of flight. Um, and what, what a number of colleagues of mine are working on is, you know, there are a number of different software packages out there that help you program your UAV, whether it's a fixed wing or, or quadcopter or rotary. And what they want to do is they want to make sure that 
as you're sharing, as you're creating a flight plan, it's shared with the rest of the community so that others mm -hmm. know that you're also flying there. So that might be one way. Using smartphone apps as well, saying, you know, checking in and saying, I'm here, here's my flight plan, and sharing that information. Or even using an SMS service could go mm -hmm. uh, a long way to, to sharing that. But we will see more and more automated. And the Europeans are working to integrating UAVs with commercial, uh, within commercial airspace um, mm. by, by 2016. And so they're creating models. They're working with uh, the, the European air traffic control uh, uh, system to make sure that you can have UAV, you know, the larger UAVs, not the kind that I mentioned, but the larger UAVs land at, 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 at international airports in Europe. Mm -hmm. Uh, as well as having commercial aircraft land as well. So they have a mandate from the European Union to get this up by 2016. Frankly, I think that's a little ambitious, but they're already creating mm -hmm. models on, on, on how these UAVs would land at the same airports. And uh, the Americans are going to follow. I mean, the, the challenge with the U.S. is that it is, it is the most complex airspace in the planet, and, and so it's going to take longer. So, but I think it's, exactly. it's inevitable that we, we move towards that. So because we have a bunch of engineers on, on this webinar on naturally, uh, we have some very technical questions that have come in, and I, I don't want to swing us over to those. So uh, one repetitive theme we have here is uh, regarding power demand on the average uh, for the average UAV, and what type of batteries uh, they generally have. Uh, folks are assuming that batteries are lithium ion, uh, but uh, maybe you can speak a little bit to the charging period, uh, the working hours, and uh, you know your experience today, especially when you're working in these disaster prone areas where operation at a consistent uh, time is is quite critical. Sure. Yeah, there are some really great questions as well. So lipo batteries, for the most part, for these small ultralight UAVs, they're lipo batteries. Uh, we we had 14 of these batteries with us in Turkey. Um, already charged, and then they take about an hour to an hour and a half to, to recharge, and obviously you can recharge them at the same time, uh, as long as you have the sockets and the plugs and so on. Um, <laughs> so that's for the, e for the EBs, um, and for like the rotary wings, they'll take about an hour, uh, like for the DJI uh, Phantom that the UN is using, um, they'll give you about an hour to, to recharge, and they'll give you about 25 to 35 minutes depending on how much wind there is and how heavy the, the camera might be that you've attached to it. With the EBs mm -hmm. on one battery, we can fly for about 40 minutes. And, um, and if we fly at an altitude of about 700 meters, we can capture 10 kilometers squared of imagery at about 25 centimeter resolution. Um, oh, that's so it's quite a bit, yeah, and especially then if you have three, you're getting 30 kilometers squared in about 40 minutes, um, which is not insubstantial. So, so that's where we're at, but you know, as well as other, just like other technologies, the battery technology is going to get better and better, more durable, lighter, smaller, uh, and we're just going to have more and more of a range. It's, and, and, and then others also experimenting with solar panels as well, which is, a, uh, I think, a Facebook bought a company that has UAVs with solar panels. So the duration it's just it's it's going to continue increasing uh, considerably, I think, over the next two three years. And another technical question, but now no longer related to batteries, is more regarding you, you mentioned the resolution and that being quite great. And uh, this question came in regarding anyone working on classifying rubble via UAV imagery or other sensors, and whether or not UAV can be used to collect climactic data like temperature and air molecules. Oh, yeah. so I guess composition just basically of, of the That's atmosphere. Fair. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Definitely, yes. You can definitely do that. And there are groups in, sense in the California area where I think the uh, Nerds for Nature or Geeks for Nature, I think they're called, um, mm -hmm. they use quadcopters to basically collect samples, water samples of, of lakes and area, uh, areas that are hard to get to uh, by foot, uh, air samples, air quality, pollution. You can do all that. So basically, all the sensors that we have that are Earth-based, uh, terrestrial-based sensors, are becoming easier and easier to add to uh, UAVs because uh, they're becoming more miniature, lighter weight, and so on. You can add all kinds of, really, I mean, the sky's the limit in terms of the sensors. So you can definitely do that. I think the first part of your question, I'm not sure I got it right. The, so the, the Joint Research Center has developed that machine learning classifier to identify rubble in aerial imagery. Uh -huh. Um, mm -hmm. I, if you go to my blog, iRevolution, and you search for rubble, you'll see a blog post on that particular project. Uh, and mm -hmm. if you don't find it, people can email me, 
and I will point you to the right uh, to the right link. Fantastic. So I'm gonna. I know we're a little bit. So I hope you don't mind staying for one more minute because I think this last question no. is is quite appropriate to uh, what you were describing in your entire presentation regarding community engagement and the, and the critical uh, need for that when you are doing uh, disaster relief work. Uh, a question that came in was, do you use the feel that there is more acceptance to using UAVs in disaster response within communities in developing countries versus the, the developed world? So if you can just uh, uh, take us out on that. Uh, sure. Let me post the, uh, well, this is a link to the Rubble project. Um, that's a really, really great question. And, and I, I um, it's hard to say. I mean, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. anecdotally, um, from what I, I haven't seen much of a difference at all, to be honest. I think what is really critical is, is really having a, 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 an open conversation and saying, mm -hmm. Hi, this is what we're doing. This is what UAVs are. And, you know, there's a group in the Philippines that is using uh, UAVs to go to local communities and teach kids about aeronautics and mathematics and science and engineering and so on and we partner directly with them actually uh, on a project and so it's not just about flying the UAVs and getting the imagery but it, it can it, it you can use it as a tool for education and training and awareness raising and I think that's the right approach is saying here here's this new technology here's what it can do here's how to use it here's you know we can train you to, to, to experiment with it and here's how we think this imagery could help your community. What do you think? I mean, the community, you know, public participatory engagement and and community building and community engagement is something that's been going on for decades. And there are best practices and lessons on how to do this in the most appropriate, respectful way. And I think as long as you're able to do that in an appropriate, respectful way and have a conversation, I mean, nine out of ten times, the the, the response will be absolutely positive. And my own experience, personal experience, has been people. Uh, uh, and it's been mostly, I, I should qualify, in, in developing countries, but um, for almost always, I've not had a single, single situation where people have said, no, we don't want to fight this, or, or no, we're concerned. There's interest, there's excitement, the kids love this, they see this as a, adults as well see this as a bit of a toy, and they're intrigued, mm -hmm. and it creates conversation, and it creates excitement, and, and then they get to try it out. And it really, it, it, it is what, what that video documentary showed, it, it, the UAV can unite and bring the community together. and so. I've just had over and over just incredibly positive interest, curiosity, engagement uh, as a response. It's never been, get away from me, like, what are you doing? Uh, obviously, that's the reaction you're going to get if you're going to be a jerk about it and, and if, you're, if you're just going to you know, have a, an arrogant attitude. But if you're coming and you're humble and you say, I don't have all the answers, here's what I'm trying to do, what do you think, would this community be in, interested in getting involved? Then, then you're doing it the right way. Uh, and if they have concerns, then they will tell you. Say, well, yes, you can do this, but we'd rather you not share the imagery at this particular resolution, if you like. We'd rather uh, you share it with us first. You know, and make it a, make it a conversation rather than we will do this and we know best. Uh, and then, then you're in, you're in good you're in good footing. I think those are words to the wise across various sectors, uh, beyond drones. Uh, this just applies uh, as a rule of thumb for global development work as a whole. So on that note, I'd, I'd like to close this webinar and thank everybody for attending. Um, please know that you can uh, get your certification, your PDH hours, uh, by emailing us uh, via the webinar's um, address, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much for staying a little bit over time. And thank you so much to Patrick, uh, Dr. Patrick, for uh, joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to, to share your experiences with us. It's been fantastic. Um, have a great uh, Yes, thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Have a great evening or morning, wherever you may be. And we will catch you on our next webinar in a month. Take care.